Right, shall we? Let's get, let's get going with the next session. That was very efficient, everybody who managed to switch between rooms and keeping us nicely on time. So thank you very, very much for doing that. Um, I'm now sitting with uh, Mark Rowlands, head of DC services at Mercer. Um, he was meant to be here with Niall O'Callaghan, who's uh, unfortunately got strep throat. So we thought, you know what, perhaps not bring him to a room full of people. We'd appreciate that. But uh, Mark is more than capable, I think, for doing, doing the work of two people. He's done it many times before. And I want to talk to Mark very much, you know, sort of following on some of the conversation we were doing earlier about personalization and the change of re in reward and benefits, um, perhaps a bit more on financial well-being as well. And Mark, you've done a lot of work with Professor Bonazzi of UCLA um, looking at well-being and, and technology. Could you just spend a few minutes telling us a bit more about that and what you found? Sure. So... Um from the conversations I've, I've been party to um, this morning, it's, there's been a lot of great chat around how we can use data, how we can use technology, and how that will evolve, how benefits are created, and then how they're shared with employees. Where I want to start is actually, whilst that's absolutely true, we need to remember that people aren't necessarily rational, and we need to think about how people make decisions. How do you engage people? And um, go, yeah. we've been working a lot with a guy called um, Slomo Bonazzi, which is a name you'll never forget now. Um, can I have a quick show of hands? How many of you have heard of him? Okay, that's about less than 2%. So a quick overview of him, just very quickly. So I've worked with him for 15 years. He's a professor at UCLA. He's an expert in behavioral psychology and decision making. If you think back to the 2000s when behavioural psychology first became mainstream and books like Nudge appeared and we became aware of concepts like inertia, fear of regret, those sorts of matters which came into the sort of pension scheme design and benefit scheme design. That was a lot of that work was done by Benazzi at UCLA, um, a guy called Richard Thaler who wrote the book Nudge. If any of you have heard of the book Nudge, he was at Chicago. There's a guy at Harvard called David Labson. Why he's interesting, believe it or not, he was the first person to put people into MRI scanners and got them to make financial decisions. Why is that relevant? We know that emotional stimuli will generate an action, whereas the traditional way of doing benefit communication and pensions communication relies on a cognitive thought process. We put data in front of people, we expect them to make a rational decision. And guess what? It hasn't worked. It hasn't worked globally. So whilst we think about the role of data and financial wellness, we have to start with the principle of how do you generate sustained behavioural change and what do we know from the science? And there was a lot of chat in the previous session, for those of you in there, about the role of Amazon and what we could learn from Facebook. Whilst that enables us to personalise data, let's not forget the fact that every day of every week they're running thousands of A-B tests every single day with their customers. So they understand what works and what doesn't work from a, a journey and a member experience perspective. So it's not just about the tech, it's about doing the understanding of the science in terms of people's decision making. So the work with Benazzi was very much around, let's fast forward to the sort of early 2010 period. Um, I reached out to him again to really understand in our society, which is changing beyond recognition because of data and the digital society we now live in, what does that mean from a decision-making and what does it mean from a benefit design perspective and how do you then drive engagement and how do you drive financial wellness? Let me give you a stat. So in 1985, as consumers, we received the equivalent of two pages of the Times newspaper by way of data. You fast forward to 2010, that has accelerated to 20 newspapers of data. Now let's stop and think what that means. So the, what has become the commodity is human attention. Your employees will probably spend less than 15 seconds thinking about any one issue. So that has major design implications in terms of how do we actually try and stimulate a conversation and get folk to engage. So in this digital world, we have to think about um, how do we personalise it and how do we then drive the change? So if I sort of summarise a huge amount of research into sort of three simple statements, 
and we've produced a white paper which you can, I, I can um, wave, and if you want it, you can get a copy afterwards, um, which goes into it in a bit more detail. It's about personalise the data. So we have to personalise. If you use segments or general, general data, you won't get a, the optimum result. Personalise the timing. Now, this is really interesting. If you personalise the timing of when pe you either push messages out or you stimulate a, an interaction to, so the employee pulls it, you get a far better result when you uh, think about the timing. And the third thing is personalise the call to action. And if you can eliminate the gap between raising awareness and closing out the gap from raising the awareness and the action, you've got something that works. And that's the success of why mobile phone banking is accelerated beyond all recognition compared to internet banking. Yeah, tenfold faster growth rate because it's in the moment. If you can create, going back to attention has become the commodity, if you can create something and you can close that gap, then you will get interaction and engagement with your employees. Let me show you one example of something we've built with Benazzi's um, input. Um, so I'm about to show you a video. It's, it's a personalised video. It's a template. It lasts for about 90 seconds, and I'll explain some of the science in it, and then we'll, I'll try and apply that a bit more to sort of the broader financial wellness. But this is an example of how I think this, this is going to develop rapidly now. Hi, John. We at Company PLC appreciate the contribution you have made to our organisation and want to help you plan for your future. This 90 second video is personal. It's about you and your pension. The total contributed to your pension during the last year was over £2,500. This was made up of over £1,500 from Company PLC and over £1,000 from you. Because of tax relief, the actual cost to you was under £900. Your pension fund is now worth over £20,000. Well done. A successful retirement savings plan ensures that you have enough income to maintain your desired standard of living after you stop working. One way to think about this is to compare your current income to your projected income in retirement. Are you on track? Based on your current savings rate, we estimate that you will receive over £800 per month in retirement. This is around £850 less than you currently take home per month. Are you comfortable with this projection? If not, you can boost your annual savings rate by 2% each year until your total personal contribution reaches 12%. While you might not even notice this increase, it will dramatically improve your financial future. Click here to take action now to boost your annual retirement savings. That's got a load of science in it, and whether that's the right mock-up for you or not, who knows. Um, even things like the narrative, like saying thank you for your contribution this year, what does that do? It changes how people receive the message. Things like the housing, it came in in a two-by-two two grid. The best house was in the top left-hand corner. That's no accident. It's got the click to action within it, and within that mock-up, which is about pension contributions, there were four different endings, so different folk could get different endings, ranging from click within it to click to book an appointment. Everything was within there. We've um, a couple of stats from a client we went live with a couple of months ago. Within 48 hours, 65% of employees had viewed the video. Um, and interestingly, the mix between desktop and mobile was about 50-50. 21% um, of the people who viewed it clicked to follow the action and increase their contributions. Absolutely unheard of from an engagement campaign. Why? Because it's using technology and behavioural insights. So that is, I think, a, an overview of the decision-making process. If we think about from a, a financial wellness perspective now, it's, I mean, financial wellness means different things to different folks. So when I look at it, I look at it from a, a corporate lens. Why does an employer think about financial wellness? It's around, oh, you as an organisation getting most use from your existing spend? Is it really hitting the needs of your people? And can you do anything with that existing spend from a return on investment perspective to make sure you're addressing the absence needs, the presenteeism, the cost of turnover? You know, when you look at benefits today, it, it, it's, it's really interesting. There's, um, 
most people are focused on the asset side. So I think, you know, at pensions and spending money on bike to work, those sorts of things. If you actually talk to a lot of employees, their biggest concern is debt. There's 17 million employees in the UK with less than £100 in savings. What happens when they bump their car on the way into work? They put it on their credit card. 75% of people with credit cards are paying an APR of over 20%. This is the reality of employees' lives right now. So I think benefit design will change and financial wellness will ad address a lot of those needs by actually thinking, how do we help people, whether they're low income or high income, make better use of that existing money? So we can use technology and we can use the behavioural insights to actually help address that conundrum. So as an employer, you're getting um, better engagement, you're getting better return on investment. And if we use the data to create the analytics, you can then actually see, as the, one of the previous speakers was talking about, you can actually see what employees are doing. And let me give you a very quick example. We did some work with a, a large retailer. They put some collateral on their intranet around care. And all of a sudden, they were inundated. Yeah? And the reason they were inundated, when they actually sort of did a bit more uh, analysis of what was happening, and they did some focus groups with folk, they actually discovered that 20% of their population had a caring responsibility. They, had, they were blindsided by that. None of their benefits addressed the issue of care. And these were people maybe of my generation who were looking after old, elder mum, elder dad, that sort of thing. It wasn't the childcare scenario, it was the elder care scenario. And that's one of the things that the analytics enabled them to do because then they can then address that from a benefit design perspective to actually help those folk. So the data, it actually not only helps the employee, but it helps the organisation as well, make sure the benefits are um, the right benefits. Sorry, Debbie, I've rattled on. And that's, that's absolutely fine because... As you were talking, it's, it's struck me of, of that's well and good, but we've seen a world up till now where technology and pension, you know, you know like you've shown us the video, because there's money in pensions, there's investment, so people are happy to provide things to employees. When it comes to things like debt and care and low-paid employees, that's a bit harder to square that circle. Is it realistic that providers are going to provide something that's affordable for employers to put into place? Are our employers going to say, yes, I can afford to put that technology in place to cover those, what you might call, softer areas? Yeah, yeah I, I, well, I take issue with the softer area because, look, I'll answer the question in a minute, but the, the softer <laughs> bit, this is absolutely about the productivity point that was in the previous conversation. You know, we're working with a client, and let me give you an example to try and make it real. Um, we're working with a client, it's got a big um, call centre, staffed full of graduates. Um, they get paid about 23 to 25 grand. Um, basically, it takes them about three years to become fully productive in that organisation. But they've come out of university, they've got £30,000 debt, they're spending 50% of their take home pay on rent, let alone trying to save for a house. Guess what? If a competitor comes and says, I'm going to offer you £1,500 more, what happens? They change jobs. So the training that first organisation has done, and the issue they've got is they've got a massive turnover problem in that cohort of people. So their KPR, mm. KPI from the HRD is, how do we reduce the turnover in that cohort? And it's a major problem. So the, the products exist, mm -hmm. and the technology exists. What we increasingly need to do, and I think organisationally I'm, I'm starting to see this, is organisations are starting to think about, from an HR perspective, what the employer value proposition is. And actually, the, the, the sort of leading thinking is now moving that to an individual value proposition. So it's not about segments, it's about what keeps any individual in an organisation. And that could be things like, do you know what? The benefit design is helping me pay off my debt. It's helping me save for a deposit on a house. And then a £1,000 pay rise or a £1,500 pay rise someone's got a much greater emotional and psychological bond to that organisation. So there's a direct causal link here in terms of the return on investment an organisation gets, along with some of the softer stuff. But you need the data mm -hmm. to build the business case. So any organisation who then wants to change their benefits needs to have the data to understand this. In terms of the tech stuff, um, let, let me show you... Um, we've done this, and obviously there's loads of different solutions out there. This is a, a health app. It sits on top of um, 
existing flex platforms, existing benefits you may offer, whatever. And it enables people to go in and, and, and play with this. And the usage we've had from this has been phenomenal. And what it gives them, it gives them a wheel. And you can see it's green to red. And we use a principle of data insight action. So the data can be some data that you already hold. It can be data that the individual puts in. And the action is all around then the collateral you build on the back of it. So you can have a whole set of uh, collateral-based information, which can be videos, it can be PDFs, it can be a call line to actually speak to an advisor. That's down to you in terms of what you want that to be. But by making this sort of real and linking it to existing data, we've seen fantastic usage of this. So the point about how do you get people to use it is, or how do you get them to give over their personal information if it's useful for them, they'll give their personal information. If it's not useful for them, they won't. And there has to be, I think, a little bit of a gap between when you're talking about an employer benefit and when you're talking about something which is privately owned. So this sort of thing is privately owned, and we've taken this approach to... Oh, sorry. That's, our, that's a money version. That's in beta testing right now, and it's doing exactly the same sort of thing. And it's giving people the ability to move and look at where they're um, read. And then it gives them back to this behavioral insight. You've got to give them the ability. When they see it's read, you have to give them the ability to find out more. And you have to give them the ability to fight, take an action. All within that conversation. Because as soon as you've raised their awareness, but if you don't close the gap, that's a wasted interaction. And that's why smartphones are the enabler that's going to make this happen. And to the point about data and people, research from the University of Liverpool proved that people, when they're making a financial com decision, actually want to speak to someone. So we have to think data is not a magic bullet here. You have to integrate the data solutions with your broader communication strategies, because otherwise you won't get an optimum result, in our opinion. People need to be able to talk to someone. I'm wondering, before we carry on, if there are any questions coming from the audience. Um, so whoever's running Slido in this room, if we are able to get the um, questions up, if, if you're okay with that, Mark, see what people are, are asking. Um, personalized video looks great, but this would not be, would this not be out of date instantly and therefore limited ROI is one question. Can, How much does it cost to create yeah, yeah, I can, a Let me video? cover both yeah, those. Yeah, why don't you do both um, of those? Personalised videos can be done in two ways. It can be done in a batch process or they can be done in real time. So batch would be appropriate if you were doing an uh, annual benefit statement. And it, you can think pension, you can think total reward statement. There's that moment in time when you want to push something out. So that, that's in date at that moment. You can also do it on the fly or just in time. So you can build the, the technology exists so you can actually serve real-time data. Um, interesting point on timing. Traditionally, uh, pension statements get issued at a date of the corporate's choosing, typically because of history, and no one actually quite knows why it goes down on the, the 1st of September, but it does. If you can personalise the timing to an individual, you get a better response rate. Let me give you an example. From the, behav the behavioural guys talk about the temporal effect or the fresh start effect. We might recognise it as New Year's resolutions. Gym membership is busiest on a Monday. You'll get a greater engagement from your people if you communicate in January compared to any other month. And you'll get a greater engagement still if you communicate in their month of birth, rather than sending everything to all your employees on the 1st of September. Um, the, the question about cost, um, we've boilerplated this. And if you use the boilerplate, um, it's about £15,000. Okay. We've got one minute. Yeah. Shall we do the global question? Is the pensions tech available globally or is it UK specific? That's a great question. Um, it's getting global. What I mean by that is we've done work with clients in different territories. We're fully integrated with Ireland. We're rolling it out in Canada, North America and Australia and we're progressing it across Central Europe. Brilliant. Thank okay. you, Mark. I'm going to wrap up at this point. Yeah. Really interesting stuff that's happening in the, in the, the, sp the space at the moment. So um, let's give a big round of applause to Mark. Give him a rating.